Hello, everyone, and welcome to Todd Talks. Today, I am joined by James Hake. He is the lead writer at D&D Beyond, and we are talking about the Oath of Vengeance Paladin. This is a paladin who, well, they want vengeance. And it's a very interesting, very well-designed, maybe it's too well-designed, subclass for paladins. And we're going we're gonna, to uh, delve deeply into the Oath of Vengeance, which already, from the get-go, is a very unique paladin uh, when you compare them to all of the rest of the oaths, right? Yeah. So the Oath of Vengeance Paladin is the the last of the three Paladin oaths that you find in the player's handbook. Um, and compared to the other two Paladins, it kind of makes up a trifecta of, uh, of Paladin archetypes. Uh, the Oath of Devotion is the very classic lawful good, you know, straight back, stiff upper lip, good guy. Um, the Oath of the Ancients is this very sort of green knight warden of the natural world character. The Oath of Vengeance is, uh, if you played 4th edition D&D, you might recognize it as very similar to the Avenger class, but uh, this guy is very much a, a Batman type, justice at any cost, always fight the greatest evil, no mercy for the wicked sort of guy. Um, and... <laughs> I, I think if you, if you want to play a, a grittier paladin, this is absolutely the way to go for you. If you like that new Batman trailer, then this is definitely your jam. Uh, yeah. Because all the ten tenets of this oath are vengeance. You yeah. know, fight the greater evil. No mercy for the wicked. By any means necessary and restitution. Mm -hmm. This is uh, someone who is heroic, but not not above doing very unheroic things to make things happen. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the tenets of the Oath of Vengeance because uh, there, there are four of them and you just listed off all of them. The first three are, I, I think, pretty straightforward, pretty immediately obvious to anyone who wants to play this class. You fight the greater evil. You always focus on the big bad guy. Let, uh, let everything else fall to the wayside. They're single-minded. No mercy for the wicked. Uh, you might you might spare the lives of normal lesser goons, but that one guy you will show them no mercy, right? You'll you'll do unto them as they have done unto everyone else, and you'll get them by any means necessary. But that final one, yeah. the final tenet of restitution, is a very interesting one. It, it's the full text is: If my foes wreak ruin on the world, it is because I failed to stop them. I must help those harmed by their misdeeds. I think this adds a little bit of dimension to this otherwise kind of judge dread like uh, hard edged character. The, you don't have to play a square jawed uh, hard ass in order to play this character. You can be nurturing and caring for people who have suffered greatly, but you know that the, the best defense in many ways is a good offense. It's it's one of the most responsible tenets in a way, because this is a character who, who maybe already feels tremendous guilt. Mm. Again, when you mentioned Batman or many dark gritty superheroes, like Judge Dredd doesn't necessarily feel that way. I would say Judge Dredd <laughs> is more of an oath of conquest paladin. Oh yeah. That, you know, that's a or, fair point. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> to, hanging out with the clerk, the, 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 the clerics of order, right? You know, yes. <laughs> just making sure yes. the law gets done. <laughs> Absolutely. But this restitution, this uh, this guilt, this is something that, that factors into a lot of gothic narratives. Mm. I mean, uh, mm. certainly, I can see the crow having being having this oath of vengeance makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, like, if I don't do this, no one will. I need mm. to be the hero. Mm -hmm. If I fail, this is on me. And so it's, it's an interesting tenet that, like you take responsibility for yourself. Yeah, and and uh, as far as these role-playing traits go, I think this is a paladin that uh, a lot of the trouble that they find uh, is trouble that they've created themselves because of these tenets. Uh, you always fight the greater evil and uh, you get them by any means necessary, even if that means letting lesser evils slip to the wayside. Uh, mm. This is a very single-minded oath that doesn't really... Um, care a lot about the, the the little things and those little things those little evils can sprout and they can be, become new situations that continue to harm people um, and so having this last one where you are constantly balanced between stopping the the big 
singular evil and caring for people who may be harmed by whatever uh, whatever collateral damage you've created in your quest for vengeance. Uh, it, it creates a nice balance, I think. It, it's also interesting because I can see this, uh, another great example of a character this works very well for is the character of Corvo from the Dishonored series. Ooh. And they have this moral quandary built into the game of, okay, you could stealth everything and be non-combative and the city will flourish or you can just kill a bunch of the bad guys but then rats and plague will infect the entire city and mm. the entire city changes based on how you decide to enact your vengeance whether you kill or whether you just knock people out and turn them in this defines that game and this defines this character this character could also be, in my mind, I'm sort of reminded by Serenity, actually. Mm. Um, the bounty hunter who mm. believes in good so much in almost a um, sociopathic way, <laughs> right? They know that they must do evil for the greater good yeah. and they have no real feelings about it otherwise and they will make all these choices. You don't need to make this dark and brooding character. You can make this character who's like, creepily okay with these tenants right who <laughs> does not feel them extremely they just are almost robotic in their focus yeah um and th um, these tenants mm -hmm. are really fantastic for role play and i think that's kind of well it's one of the one of the reasons people are drawn to it there's a lot of mechanical reasons as yeah. well though right yeah you you just brought it up one of the great mechanical reasons it, this class makes a great bounty hunter i think yeah. people are, are drawn to the paladin class often because of the strength of its role play uh just kind of baked right in but uh the mechanics for this subclass are very solid um <laughs> i was in the comments of this this subclass is class 101 article from uh this monday and i was running down some math that I'll get into later, but there, there really is a very, very tight balance on this subclass. It quite impresses me, actually. Uh, so let's just get into it. Um, every Paladin Oath has a couple of things that you get uh, at third level when you gain the subclass. Um, it's, it's quite a bit, actually. So the first is a channel divinity. Just like a cleric, you get a one use of channel divinity and two ways to use it between your rests. Um, and the first usage of your channel divinity is called Abjure Enemy. So as an action, you'll present your holy symbol, you'll speak a prayer of denunciation, and one creature of your choice within 60 feet must make a wisdom save, um, and fiends and undead have disadvantage on the save. If they fail, they're frightened for one minute or until they take any damage, and while frightened like this, their speed is zero. So they're, they're paralyzed with fear, essentially. It's a really great single target crowd control tool something like one, two, three, four, four levels before wizards get something comparable in the case of um, Polymorph. Around, and it's also around the same time the clerics get uh, a similar tool in Hold Person. Uh, so really very and, uh, good. And yeah, I mean, also you have to remember like Frightened, that means it is an AoE. So like the Undead Warlock, for example, that's only when they hit somebody do they have to make the saving throw. Frightened condition means they have disadvantage to even hit you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. which now you're being extremely tanky yeah and and this is like frightened plus because their speed has dropped to zero too they're basically yeah. uh, un unless you're right next to this guy they're basically out of the fight until they take damage or until they uh, yeah it it, it yeah. can just be you and them <laughs> and, and let, let me let me uh go even further and say that and show that they don't get subsequent saves on this. They don't get to make a wisdom save at the end of every turn. Uh, once they're abjured, if they fail the save, they are locked in this state until a, either a minute passes or they take damage, uh, which is really very good. Um, and even there, there's even stuff that happens on a successful save. It's not quite as much of a lockdown as it is otherwise, but their speed is still halved for the full minute or until they take damage. So there's still kind of this lingering uh, chill in their heart very powerful if you're like on a train for example that in eberron that's about to crash and you do this <laughs> right or stay right the, there but the, yeah. yeah or the wizard wants to drop a fireball i mean you can do some dark things with this and since you are the oath of vengeance you may do some terrible things yeah um with this uh it's yeah it's stream it's it's extremely powerful at third level that's really great and then we have the vow of eminent enmity 
Yeah, the vow of enmity is a really cool one. Um, and it works really well in conjunction with what the paladin does because it's a bonus action. Paladins love to have their action for dealing big melee damage. Right. So in addition to that, as a bonus action, you can use your channel divinity to uh, choose a creature within 10 feet of you. Um, and then you gain, and like, they don't, they don't make a save. You just say you, and you gain advantage on all the attack rolls you make uh, for the next minute or until it drops to zero hit points or falls unconscious. Um, it's basically just like, look at a guy and it's like, I'm going to kill you now. <laughs> They're like, There's nothing they can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It's extremely powerful. Like uh, advantage means you're, you're going to have a high, a higher chance of getting a critical, which of course you mm -hmm. want desperately as a paladin. Mm -hmm because mm -hmm. then you can drop your smites mm -hmm. and do some massive just rolling of damage. If you're like doing an elven paladin and you have an elven accuracy, now you're increasing your chance by like almost 22% of getting like a, of a critical hit. And, you know, if you're being very min maxi about this stuff, but this is, I mean, they've got disadvantage fighting you. You've got advantage fighting them. You might as well be in the dark. Yeah. A am you know, I remembering this wrong? Did Liam O'Brien play a multi-classed assassin, rogue, and vengeance paladin in campaign one of Critical Role? Because I don't that remember is a... if he was an assassin rogue. Um, um, but, well, anyway. Uh, right. the assassin, rogue, and vengeance paladin make a, a bit of a killer multi-class if you really want to be the bounty hunter that lurks in the darkness because uh if you can just kind of choose someone they don't even they don't even know you're there they don't need to know you're there to uh if you vow of enmity them mm -hmm. uh you can just be like lurking on a gargoyle batman arkham asylum style like we were talking about last week mm -hmm. uh, and you can point at a guy and say you're marked for death and then you leap down and you assassinate them and it's just bam 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 every turn you've got advantage so every turn you've got sneak attack uh, yeah that's that's fair yeah yeah i mean you can it's, solo it's, this character like <laughs> <no tomorrow. laughs> it's it's a pretty tight little thing uh but even even in the context of a single character if you're not playing with multi-class if you're not using that optional rule just in terms of being a standard melee focused somewhat tanky damagey paladin this is still great for you yeah it's a lot and then you we, we take a look at this oath these the oath spells that every paladin gets we've yes. got bane which is the opposite of bless you know they're mm -hmm. losing that 1d4 on everything mm -hmm. hunter's mark and that we're way ah. back into this whole notion of being a bounty hunter of mm -hmm. knowing where you are all the time um getting increased damage every time you hit them i mean mm -hmm. it is concentration based so it is going to be a fiddly with some of your smites that are outside that's... your divine smite right um I, this is a strong case to be made uh for and i go into this in great detail in the paladin 101 article but uh, oh, this was the math I was talking about. Hunter's Mark and your normal Divine Smite are very similar in damage over time. It means that while normal Paladins or, or well, Paladins who are not Vengeance Paladins have this very sort of spiky looking damage grab. They hit with a gigantic Divine Smite and then they just kind of, they conserve their spell slots, they wait a little bit and then they spike again for a huge damage and they go back down and they spike again. It kind of looks like that mm -hmm. while they're fighting. Whereas if you're a Vengeance Paladin, you might be focused on a slightly more consistent damage over time graph. Uh, over the course of about three rounds, a lot of D&D combats last for about three rounds. If you were to cast Hunter's Mark and hit every single time with it uh, over the course of three rounds, you do about 40 damage. Whereas if you were a paladin who did one big smite and then just did normal attacks for the rest of the fight, you do about 39 damage. So uh, a first level divine smite and a first level hunter's mark are more or less balanced against each other. And it's the way you use them uh, the, uh, that determines which one is stronger. So that's what I'm saying about this being a very tightly balanced class. The math just kind of works out for them. But uh, a divine smite doesn't require concentration, does it? It doesn't. If you really wanted, if you wanted to not conserve your resources and really burn everything, yeah. you could hunter's mark a target and drop divine your divine smite, smite on it. All other smites huge. outside of that, outside of elder smite and divine smite, are all are all concentration. So you right. can't you can't like right to double up on all that stuff. Yeah. But again, this is you tracking a foe, and you're not going to lose them. Uh, mm -hmm. hold person and misty step this Great. is so batman <laughs> <laughs> you know um you can hold person and get those nasty nasty crits on on that character again like you said mm -hmm. you know if you if, if you dipped into assassin this is getting dark real fast mm -hmm. um 
and Misty Step obviously is such an odd thing for Paladin to have. Um, just an all fully armored guy just bamfing around the battlefield. <laughs> I do feel because, and here it's a great spell list that we're looking at, but ultimately I think a lot of people, people are saving their stuff for their smites. This, this hold person that you bring up uh, really emphasizes some disgusting uh, critical hit potential for yeah. this build, especially if you're multiclassed into assassin. Um, because let's say you, you, you've just gotten your fifth level of paladin spells. That means that as a paladin, you are your fifth level. So your second level paladin spells, you're a fifth level paladin and you've taken three levels of rogue feet assassin. So you're an eighth level character. Um, you can hold person a guy, uh, which means that you've got advantage on them on attacks against them. And all of your melee attacks against them are automatically criticals. Um, <laughs> you've got a solid 2d6 of sneak attack you can drop another second level spell slot for three uh it's a 3d8 a 3d8 divine smite damage and then it's automatically a critical so all of those dice are doubled uh there there is a potential for just an enormous burst of damage against a single target if that's the way you want to play it and because this guy's all about going against the one big target that seems yeah. like uh, exactly the way that he was intended to play. It's dark. Hold person is a dark spell. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not a spell I would I would toss out unless there were bullies, uh, or if one particular character was so awful. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, even if I was like fighting a bunch of goblins, I don't know that I would like hold any of them <laughs> because mm. of some. There's there's a darkness there to that spell. And obviously, Misty Step is a great utility spell for moving around the battlefield and controlling stuff. Um, and Ninth Level Haste and Protection from Energy. And Haste is... Wow. You're getting Haste as a Paladin. So now mm -hmm. you are fast. This is one of the coolest things about the Oath of Vengeance spell list. And I, I think actually all of the Paladin's Oath spells is that they largely pull from outside of what the Paladin usually gets. Yeah. With the exception of, I think, Banishment at the next sort of tier of these Oath spells, every single one of these Oath spells are not on the Paladin's normal spell list, which is so cool the way it expands your arsenal. Uh, I mean, and, and when we look at at 13th level you, you've got banishment with it which is mm. great but mm. dimension door you <laughs> yeah. really are just tell and we talk so much about the monk way of the shadow and how to play mm. that this is kind of the paladin that's kind of in the same vein of like yeah. i can be anywhere at any time i can misty step i can dimension door it feels uh, very appropriate that we're talking about this as uh, so many of these classes uh, here in October where we're talking about shadowy, spooky characters. You can be a very shadowy, spooky character uh, with, with this build. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then we've got Hold Monster, which for the same reasons, and Scrying, which is extreme utility. And I like it because, again, I get that vision of of this vengeance paladin who who is like just spying on his enemies mm -hmm. waiting for his opportunity it's like batman in his yeah. console you know with all the screens around him right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean <laughs> going back to that sort of dark knight idea it's uh right in the dark knight that sort of that sort of police state setup was very much uh, yeah. a, a criticism of things like uh you know of actual police state behavior and so as a singular vengeance oriented character it, it it can be like oh well that's that's a little weird that you can just kind of look at anyone at any time but well you yeah. know you know for the greater good it's all right but imagine a peacekeeping force in you know a fantasy city of your choosing Baldur's Gate perhaps because it's very much the Gotham of of Faerun. Uh, imagine the the head of of your of your police force your constabulary having the ability to just scry upon you at any time then you're start then it's like geez <laughs> it, this is not really a, a heroic thing anymore this is very scary for normal people it, it, i mean it's those are the fun questions that can help define your world as a dungeon master and a mm -hmm. player of what you've experienced because yeah what if the head what if your head villain is an oath of vengeance paladin yeah i mean and th this is what they're doing all the time they're spying on the citizens they're mm -hmm. they've become so obsessed 
uh, with the idea that they can stop stop crime before it happens. Um, it becomes a very interesting and and what, another, another great character. What, what which, movie am I thinking of? <laughs> stop crime before it happens. What what is it? The title uh, is on the tip of my tongue. Oh my god! Uh, no no, it's a Philip K. Dick Philip K. Dick book. Um, oh, no, it's it's Minority Report. I'm thinking Minority, Minority Report. Report. It's a Philip yeah. K. Dick book. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Minority well, Report is a, is a classic well, example of like, well, we knew you were going to do it. Mm-hmm. I think that gets inter- interesting with like a divination divination pal, uh, wizard. Wow! Right? You know? Wow! Yeah. <laughs> now you've got like wizards and paladins working together to shut it all down all the time. Uh, now that's the plot. Yeah. Woof. Plus, if you know they're going to commit a crime, it's kind of fun. Like if you use your. You know, we're off topic here but diviners can be very dark <laughs> um and v for D- vendetta is another fantastic example of this i am an, more of an oath than i am a person yeah even more than batman because that's the whole idea like I, and i think you know, there are a lot of similarities though with those viewpoints of like i'm an idea mm-hmm. you know you can't kill you know ideas are bulletproof um yeah I think we're doing a great job demonstrating here how how many of the ideas in these D&D subclasses, particularly flavorful ones like the Paladin ones, um, can instantly tie back to a pop culture idea that yeah. you and your friends can all relate to. And because D&D is a game of the imagination, having a familiar cultural touchstone to say, yeah, my character is kind of like Batman or my character is kind of like V, then they're instantly like, oh, okay, I got it. Um, and you, you have to be careful not to lean into it too hard because then you're just like playing Batman or playing V. You're not your own character. But yeah, I mean, maybe see it as an opportunity to, okay, how do I not want to be Batman? How do I not want to be this character? <laughs> how do you <laughs> differentiate the... yourself? Yeah. yeah, like how do I be something stranger or something in the other other direction of this? You know, mm-hmm. um, like I said, that sociopathic character mm-hmm. who who just believes this in an almost robotic faction. Uh, 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 fashion is interesting so yeah it, it's fun to play into these kind of r- these icons of pop culture but yeah you never limit yourself as a role player um by shoving yourselves into these kind of scenarios because that's why we have so many different so many characters are interesting that kind of fit into this class but you can do this in a lot of different ways yeah this is why i want to play an oath of redemption paladin who is a trickster I'm very looking forward to covering Oath of Redemption once we get to Xanathar's. There's guide. so much delicious stuff. I love the idea of an evil Oath of Redemption paladin who's just constrained <laughs> by those beliefs mm. and would be so awful. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that brings us to Relentless Adventure. Yes, uh, tell me about this. Level feature. Um, it is a it's a sort of feature that keeps your foes from getting away if we go back and look at those spells you'll see that all of the spells they get are for the most part uh, focused on one of two things either helping you move quickly or Mm. keeping your enemies from moving so this class is actually very much about movement and sort of uh, lockdown um so when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, you can move up to half your speed immediately after the attack as part of the same reaction. And this movement doesn't itself provoke opportunity attacks. I can see a uh, an Oath of Vengeance Paladin with the Sentinel feat, who just kind of relies on other enemies uh, moving yeah. around to kind of like maneuver their way around a battlefield. Yeah, Sentinel and also Pole Arm Master uh, mm-hmm. starts getting real deadly, and and, oh, yeah. and then then no one's ever getting away from you. I mean, yeah. you just you've got the entire battlefield on lockdown. So mm-hmm. um, now you're this Dark Avenger with a scythe, basically. Yeah, <laughs> with, or like sort of like a, like a Darth Maul sword. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 this is a, a lot of battlefield control now at mm-hmm. seventh level. This is very very powerful, and if you it's you'd be hard pressed not to take one of those feats to be honest mm-hmm. um you're you will be challenging to your dungeon master <laughs> <laughs> i will say that <laughs> uh yeah so it's it, that's a great uh, ability to have at level seven and then we've got that brings us to soul of vengeance yeah so uh it, it, between that feature at seventh level and this one at 15th level you'll be gaining a lot of kind of standard paladin abilities so for for a little while your oath of vengeance stuff is kind of ticking along while you're getting normal paladin stuff auras improved smite that sort of thing but then at 15th level 
uh, your channel divinity, one of your channel divinities, your vow of enmity, that's the one where you point at someone nearby and say, I'm going to kill you now, and then you get advantage for until they're dead. Um, whenever the creature that you have vow of enmity makes an attack, you can use your reaction to counterattack. Um, I personally, <laughs> I personally think that this feature interacts a little bit clunkily with Relentless Avenger because you are making a melee attack as a reaction, but it's not technically an opportunity attack, so you don't get the movement that Relentless Avenger gives you. Right. Um, uh, it is I, the probably first paladin that is reaction. Uh, the economy around re your reaction suddenly is like a bit of a, you know, <laughs> there's a right, lot of traffic. Right. A lot is being uh, threaded through that loophole. Yeah. Um, so if you're the kind of DM who really likes to play the rules tightly, be sure that you know what's, what's happening here. But uh, the, I, I think there might be a reason for that, why they don't want to give this opportunity attack focus paladin quite so much power. And it's because they can divine smite off of this reaction attack. Uh, uh, it gives you another way to divine yeah, yeah. smite off of your turn, right? You can only right. do it. Uh, yeah. Um, and so it makes it the more times you get to attack, the more opportunities you have to just drop a fat stack of radiant damage. Um, so a little bit of careful balancing, I'm sure, was going into this ability when they made it not interact quite so cleanly with Relentless Adventure. No, it's it's good because uh, you, you, it's it, it's a fair point. Like you are already capable of so much damage, kind of on the scale of like if you were really doing some weird multi-class stuff with Hexblade and also Paladin doing a double smite. I mean, I don't know that you need to with the Oath of Vengeance because mm -hmm. you're already doing so much damage <laughs> um, and getting so, so many opportunities to do so. Um, and you probably have advantage during all of this. Um, that brings us to like the capstone, which is always a hard thing to get to because a lot of players don't get to the 20th level, but it's, right. it's pretty intense. I love Paladin Capstones. Um, I wish that all classes had Capstones just as relentlessly cool as the Paladin Transformations that they get at 20th level. So They are wonderful, yeah. They're so much fun um, because they do such a good job of encapsulating everything that's come before. Okay, so at 20th level, you gain the Avenging Angel trait, which lets you assume the form of an angelic Avenger as an action. You transform for the next hour you gain these benefits. Wings sprout from your back and grant you a flying speed of 60 feet. And you spread an aura of menace in 30 feet around you. So the first time an enemy enters this aura or starts its turn there during combat, they need to make a wisdom save, or become frightened of you for a minute or until it takes any damage. And attack rolls against those frightened creatures have advantage. Um, so it basically gives you a flying speed and a souped up version of your abjure enemy channel divinity. You are just a flying, terrifying, I mean, it, it's Batman. <laughs> this really is the epitome of Batman, the terrifying winged Avenger that swoops in from the skies. Except this time you can actually fly, you're not just gliding. And, and you're, you're changing the battlefield for everyone involved too. Mm -hmm. Like your whole party now has advantage. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it plays well with everyone else. Um, I don't think it's overpowered at all by any means. Um, 20th level think... is so wild and woolly already. You could probably get yeah, just yeah. about I, anything. I, I don't feel like any of the Paladin's <laughs> 20th level abilities or are, 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 uh, capstones are overpowered. I, no. I think they're fun and I think they're evocative because you know what you're getting. You're going to yeah. change into something really cool. Yeah. That's why I like they're, Oath of they're... Ancients. Yeah. yeah, Their cool factor is off the charts. Yeah, and that's what you want at 20th level. You don't necessarily mm -hmm. need something that ends the world. Um, <laughs> and, and you're already doing so much damage. Uh, yeah. What What are some things we should consider when playing an Oath of Vengeance Paladin, in your opinion? Hmm. I think we've talked a little bit about a lot of the considerations that go into playing a character like this one. We've talked about the, the role play considerations, and the, the Paladin is certainly bursting with those it, it goes a long way to helping you play a character like this with the the tenets of your oath um we've talked about some multi-classing considerations when it comes to uh maybe playing an assassin i'll bet you could play a wicked way of shadow monk that multi-classes with a uh, vengeance paladin um but there are some other small mechanical considerations as well. There are what spells you take in addition to your oath spells, and there are some feats that you could take as well. I, Todd, I know you love getting into character builds. Shall we talk about feats a little bit? 
Uh, yeah, like we we we, t- we talked about the feats that made a lot of sense for this because you're getting reactions. It'd be, um, you know, if Paladins had any kind of uh, <laughs> range spell, then I would think of like <laughs> Warcaster would be kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're you're really looking at Polar Master. You're really looking at using the Sentinel feat. Anyone who uh, within five feet of you that attacks something that isn't you, um, mm-hmm. you can use your reaction to attack them. Mm-hmm. This is really great. Uh, especially if you're a warlock and you're sneaky like me. I mean, you are burning a spell slot, but um, this is a very powerful thing for like the blade singer wizard. Mm-hmm. Uh, because technically, if you have the sentinel feet and they attack one of your mirror images, and I confirm this with you know Jeremy Crawford, them accidentally attacking one of your mirror images causes this feat to work. Now, yes. this would have been a nightmare if they put mirror image into this particular paladin build as well. <laughs> because then they they would there would almost be this ex- expectation. This is a very tanky. I think this is one of the most damage dealing paladins ever. I'd probably be tempted to get great weapon master since I feel like I'm getting probably going to get a crit here and there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I could just cut through somebody and then hit somebody else. <laughs> So interesting you bring up mirror image. I've I've popped it open here on DD Beyond. And I'm looking at who gets mirror image. And there are the usuals. There's sorcerer, warlock, wizard. Right. Um, the circle of land druid gets it interestingly. The mm. trickery domain cleric gets it, which I think is a Oh, bit I'm exciting. very aware. Yeah. And the, <laughs> <laughs> and the armorer artificer in unearthed arcana gets it as well i feel like if you wanted if you really wanted to get mirror image as this class it would be it would probably make the most sense to take a a little three level dip into either uh trickery cleric yeah or maybe even into warlock I mean, again, you're looking at that that warlock paladin build. Um, it, you mm-hmm. are kind of a nightmare on the battlefield, and mm-hmm. and if you went hexblade, I wouldn't do that. Like right now, I'm playing an undead warlock, and uh, it'd be pretty tempted to dip into the vengeance, even though I, mm-hmm. I feel more of a calling for conquest is more like odd. It, it, there's not a lot of synergy there, but it's amusing. I and would that's, love. Oh, sorry, go on, go on. No, no, yeah. I mean, that's the thing about like when you think about multi classing. Think about the story because it's very easy to get lost into the crunch of like, this is the ultimate build of all time. And yeah, obviously, you know, Hexblade Warlock (laughs) synergizes very well with Vengeance Paladin. It makes sense narratively. You're then only relying on your charisma. You don't need high strength necessarily. I'm thinking of, yeah, I'm sorry, go on. Yeah, no, like, but is it a good story? I, I, I keep thinking of uh, Oath of Vengeance plus great old one warlock this is such a weird combination but I, I love this idea of a paladin who is just this relentlessly morally driven person but their sense of morality is utterly incomprehensible to us they <laughs> this paladin uh sees the 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 world in such a completely different sort of like fourth dimensional way that mm. they're, they're like you may not have known what you did you may not have known that what you did was wrong but your actions will if you continue them uh cause unspeakable horror on the world and i'm here to stop you and they're like i i literally just bought a house and that's all i did and they're like well that's that sucks for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that, that that can get quite interesting with especially with this the fact that, that you can scry mm. you know uh mm. Can, you can kind of lean into alien intelligence um, in some ways, mm-hmm. um, rather than a different type of darkness, a very Cthulhu darkness mm-hmm. um, for that. But I, I, right off the top of my head, I can't think of any other feats I would necessarily choose for this. Obviously, there's a lot of Unearthed Arcana that's out there to be used. I think the Skulker uh, feat could be quite good if you want Skul- to be a, a more Batman-like yeah, kind of guy. Absolutely. Yeah, especially if you're, you've got a DM who will play those rules. Mm-hmm. stronger mm-hmm. i think the skulker fee is one of those things i feel like the d the dm needs to kind of give you a little bit more lay of the land not unlike if you're playing a way of shadow monk right yeah we did just talk about this a lot last week about how how to make good stealth scenarios as a dungeon master and this this class benefits from that advice as well yeah i uh but i think this is a fun character to think about why are you looking for vengeance mm. um 
so maybe I would take some feats that don't necessarily make sense. Like what was your life before you decided to become an oath of vengeance mm-hmm. paladin? Like what, what brought you to this point? Mm-hmm. Because I, I like the idea, especially with this one where, you, you know, you can't take this until you're third level, yeah. third level paladin. You, you can't take this oath. So maybe you had a very, very kind of bright perspective on the world. You know? Imagine like, having the actor feat as like a human at first oh. level when you go into this class. And it's like, damn, what, what happened to you that turned your life from being a, a player on the stage into being this brooding, vengeance obsessed human? But that explains why you're so good at frightening these people, yeah. right? Why you're yeah. so good at stunning them, why you're taking reactions. I mean, if anyone knows anything about timing, it's actors. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> exactly. having that ability. And then if you're in a, it, turn, it completely changes this character. Like you said, mm-hmm. if, if you were formerly an actor and you have the actor feet, you're well, way better at deception when you've got this disguise you can use a disguise kit and now you're like hiding in plain sight as a paladin maybe right like you're you're going into this thing it could be a court intrigue yeah. kind of scenario where you yeah. go in there and you've got like a fake beard and all this stuff and you're sort of assassinating people mm-hmm. um because with your vengeance or finding out information you can gather otherwise so you, now you kind of become a detective because of your acting background mm-hmm and that's what I love about feats. They change that character completely. Yes, you can take the Sentinel feat. I get it. But <laughs> like what you just said makes me think of an entirely new character. Um, yeah, that's why I like it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's very fun. Um, we, we do have a few questions from chat real quick and, and we have some answers. Yes, Vax was an assassin rogue, Oath of Vengeance. Cool. Uh, Liam, way overpowered. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> uh are these bound are, they, are these pal- paladins not bound to instantly kill undead on site no paladins are um i can't we think were, of one that is is there i don't think so we were just kind of talking about this before the show started that it's very interesting how paladins are not actually bound to gods yeah uh in this incarnation of them and not a lot of people realize that i feel they're they're not clerics clerics are are more tightly though not completely tied to uh, divine entities but pal- uh, paladins especially oath of vengeance they're, they're tied to ideals they're tied to the tenets of the oath that they swear and and that sort of that sort of devotion to a cause is what uh infuses them with magic um it it's it's not what i do like about fifth edition is this 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 broad spectrum of magic where you know, most clerics get their powers from gods, but some get it from a philosophy. And then mm-hmm. it's allowed in the, the Dungeon Master's Guide that your cleric does not necessarily have to believe in a god. They can believe in a philosophy. And this blends nicely into the oath of pal- like a, a paladin's oath of they mm-hmm. believe in these tenets so much that they connect with magic. And then you have warlocks who have like these, you know, these not quite gods, you know, as well. And then you have wizards who just really know the math of the universe. And then you have <laughs> artificers who are just really good at building stuff. And I like how magic can come from just about anywhere. Yeah. Um, in fifth edition. I think it blends nicely now. With regards to the undead question, no, there aren't any paladin oaths that like specifically spell out you are an enemy to undead. Yeah, uh, but there are several paladins who do kind of interact very tightly with uh, undead in their story, and that would be the oath of devotion first and foremost. That's the that's the very like I said, straight back, stiff upper lip, good guy, knight in shining armor, paladin. Yeah, the, their channel divinities are kind of focused around turning undead, smiting undead. That's that, that's part of their good guy core, um, and also the uh, what's their name? The oath of conquest, paladin, is able to uh, kind of command undead in some way. That's right, and the oath breaker as well. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's uh, what I'm thinking of. Maybe I'm. No, they both do. Breaker. They both do. I believe. Oh, do they? Okay. Uh, does does smite count as a spell if so is it possible to smite twice in a turn or once again in in using a reaction smite divine smite is not does not count as a spell you use a spell slot to create this effect it is not a spell yeah Uh, Um, elder elder smite is the same way divine smite is kind of wild uh you you could conceivably uh use a spell slot 
to use like wrathful smite right one of the smite spells yeah and then divine smite on top of it there's nothing there's nothing wrong about doing that <laughs> because divine smite is all about doing wild spike burst damage right. um but yeah if you look at the text of divine smite I'll, I'll read it out there's nothing at all saying that there's any restriction on how many times per turn you can use it no restriction on any action no. um it just says this starting at second level when you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack you spend one spell slot to deal radiant damage to the target and that damage is based on the level of the spell slot you use the only condition required to do a divine smite is a melee weapon attack no action required spend the spell slot uh it's not a spell so it doesn't interact weirdly with spell casting rules it's just boom free damage well almost free yeah yeah so it it, it doesn't it's not under those uh it's no longer under those rules. And mm -hmm. let me take a look at the wording on Eldritch Smite. So there's two interesting things about these particular class smites um, that you can get. Um, it has to be a melee attack if you're a paladin. So paladins not wildly known for their ranged attacks, um, certainly. But let's try to find Eldritch Smite. And there you are. So fifth level once per turn. This is when it says once per turn. On a warlock smite, you, when you hit a creature with your packed weapon, you can expend a warlock spell slot to deal 1d8 force damage plus yada, 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 and also knock them prone. So warlocks do have this limitation of once per turn. I wonder if paladins were intent to be able to do this all the time, all willy-nilly. Of course, they don't have a ton of spell slots, but... I, I do wonder about this because you're right. There is no once-per-turn limitation on Divine Smite. Once you have extra attack and, you know, maybe if you dual wield, so right. you've got a potential of three attacks per turn, uh, you could Divine Smite on all three of those attacks and that's just a ton of damage uh you've burned all your spell slots yeah, yeah <laughs> that's you, a ton of damage i, I mean yeah you, you you've killed the boss but remember your dm can always add health points you know um right. and we'll get quite used to this trick very quickly as well as if you're playing a paladin warlock who is doing because technically by these terms you can do a double smite which mm -hmm. i might i might play around with just for giggles <laughs> but for narrative reasons, but you know, the DM's gonna get around this. You yeah. what if you what if you double smite on a simulacrum? Mm. You know, hooray, <laughs> you know, like we're the wrong guy. Like, <laughs> like you just burn through everything you have to do like a hundred points of, of melee damage. Mm. Well, was it worth it at the end? Mm -hmm. You turn your your character into a one trick pony. So mm -hmm. um that's how smites work. Yeah, you can totally add another smite on top of that. That's that's kind of why I, I said earlier that the Oath of Vengeance Paladin is really played just as well as a sort of long game damage dealer rather than a big burst damage dealer because you're more flexible that way. Your Oath spells are all really very good. Um, and so using your Divine Smite to just churn your spell slots into damage, I, I would say, uh, honestly, is the wrong move most of the time because your, your Hunter's Mark is usually as strong as a divine smite of comparable level of first level right and you've got things like misty step to use you've got things like bane uh, you are you're just as good as a as a low and slow sort of persistence hunter right humans are persistence hunters who chase their foes until they tire you're, you're not a cheetah who sprints at 60 miles an hour to tackle a guy you you go long all day long and then you tackle them when they're gasping for breath by the watering hole we, we did just get a question do you think of the oath of vengeance uh with hexplay multi-class is a bit overpowered and does it make the game a bit boring for the dm's point of view uh well i mean you're only needing one stat you're only needing charisma at this point you're getting you know you're getting a lot of advantages you're doing extra damage to that single target you know that vow of enmity you're bringing back your your critical hit to 19 and 20 mm -hmm. and you're at advantage if you got super cheesy and you went elven accuracy now you are you got a high chance of critical all the time but like are you having fun yeah here's here's the way i think of this right uh the, the developers of fifth edition said that they weren't designing the game for jerks maybe this sounds a bit judgy <laughs> but they, they they designed the game with a sort of uh good intent in mind because this isn't a computer game 
this isn't a game where a, an unbiased observer uh, adjudicates all of all of the actions. This is a right. game with a dungeon master, a human person, uh, who who can do two very powerful things. And one, change the scenario so that it's sort of you you self balance against the cheesy tactics of one power gaming player, or uh, and I think this is a better option. You talk to that player like an adult human yeah. <laughs> and, and work out whatever the problem is. Because if you're a dungeon master and you're suffering because you've got one power gaming player who's come up with a, a, an overpowered combo, um, then you, you, you've got to figure out using, you know, using diplomacy and your own real life intelligence how to work it out. And uh, it, it, it can be scary to try and use as the social skills. I, I, I've, I am always very nervous when I talk to players. I don't want to offend them. I want to make sure everyone's having fun. I don't want to feel like I'm lecturing people. Yeah. But uh, if, if you just come into a conversation with an open mind and, and the, the desire to make the game more fun for everyone, I, I think that cheesy combos like, like Hexblade, Oath of Vengeance, or, or whatever, is, um, they, they, they aren't as bad as they seem on paper. Yeah, it really depends on, I mean, if you're stealing the spotlight always in a game and you're always the person who's killing the big bad over and over and over again, well, that gets really boring, you know, no, because everyone likes to be that final person yeah. who kills the monster, you know, yeah. to an extent. And and if you're, you're taking that away from your entire party, it's pretty problematic. Um, but that's, you just have to talk to your player about it or you as a player should probably talk to your DM that you've got this evil nefarious plan to have this super like... <laughs> you know overpowered kind of character uh, being set up also yeah. hilarious if you as a dm throw an illusionary character or the wrong guy you know and they blow all their smites it's pretty funny yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> like honestly it may it makes me want to laugh so like well what you got now buddy yeah <laughs> so, i mean <laughs> I, I I would feel a little bit guilty as a DM if I frustrated a player like that, but there, there is kind of, there, there is kind of a sense of like <laughs> fair is fair, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, well, it, I, it's, I, it, I I think that maybe that's a good way to open a conversation like that is you <laughs> drop that mirror image sort of situation that simulacrum villain, and then you're like, okay, so we we both had our fun, right? Now <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we can reach some kind of well, compromise. Yeah, <laughs> game game means a response game game yeah. uh, <laughs> literally in this in this, in this instance mm. we, have, we have another question uh could paladins a paladin sorcerer use sorcery points to make more spell slots to do more smites yes they can yes I'm very aware of this they can do this yes. all day long yes um they cannot do this with warlocks because eldritch smite requires you to use a warlock spell slot mm -hmm. um this is where we see this kind of manipulation of warlocks and paladins, which I've done a lot of research into, mm -hmm. is the paladins are not required to use paladin spell slots. They only need a spell slot. And this is where I feel, feel like if there was a revision of D&D &D later on, <laughs> this might be something that might get changed. Because this is... This is something that's very interesting to me, the way that the, the Hexblade's Eldritch Smite is just a little bit different from the Paladin's Divine Smite. Yes. It, it, it makes me wonder, the, I think there's two options of why that is. Um, and I, I don't have inside information onto this. I'm speculating from the outside. Right. Um, it makes me wonder if, yes, they, they realize that Paladin's Divine Smite is a little bit funky, so they decided to put a couple of more limitations on it when they did something similar for the Warlock. That's absolutely an option. Or maybe two, the Hexblade is just a subclass. It's just a it subclass is. of Warlock. Paladin Divine Smite is a core class feature. Exactly. They might have wanted to make it a little, like a little bit OP, the way that Wizard's Fireball is just a little OP because it's so iconic. Exactly, and and and, and that's that's a fantastic, fantastic point because Smite has become core to who. Um, the paladin is yeah. for good or I mean, evil even when i started playing dnd uh like well even when i started playing dnd the paladin saying i smite evil I, I i detect evil i smite evil that's like the core paladin gameplay yeah. gameplay loop it's it's changed a bit it's become a little more nuanced since then but smite evil or just divine smite now is so core to the identity that if it were if it sucked then it would feel like like you were playing a garbage class if their core thing was not fun and it's, it's very hard to take 
away once you've done this, Ryan. Like <laughs> I, I would say uh, shape-shifting has kind of gone away from the druid. Druids weren't always always about shape-shifting. So we've, I, 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 it was always part of being a druid, but now it, it, it kind of became core. And I think, mm. I think that partially is the reason why maybe we've seen a little bit more diversity in how you can use your shape-shifting ability in druids to create different effects, which I'm a giant fan of. Mm -hmm. um, but paladins, paladins are smiters. Um, <laughs> warlocks have a lot of shifty stuff they can do. I mean, mask of many faces. I can constantly change my image as an invocation. Um, you know, if I want to get that, if you want real cheese, you know, I'm dropping darkness. I have devil's sight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just you, me, the darkness, and I have sentinel. So, like, even <laughs> if you try <laughs> to run out of my area of darkness, I hit you, your speed is reduced to zero, and now I'm way scarier than the Vengeance Paladin, honestly, because it's just you and me for everybody. Oh my god. You and yeah. me in the dark. It's horrifying. <laughs> horrifying. Avon was built this way. It was a nightmare. <laughs> and uh, I, I kept on trying to encourage my wife to play uh, also a devil, like, get that devil, the devil sights, so that we could both, like, fight in the darkness. Because it is alienating to the rest of your party, um, in a in a pretty big way. But I feel like right. if you got like one other person with you in the darkness, it's kind of like fun. Uh, it's like I don't know that I don't know who that couple is killing right now, but <laughs> they got it on lockdown. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you can't do that with sorcerers. Sorry, long long answer to a short question. Uh, you can you can definitely do that kind of sorcerer paladin a build i remember multi-classing is optional and, yeah. and that's what people need to remember when they're like well how could they allow this horrible like you know you know because we have a lot of charisma casters for example right we only have two intelligence casters um how can you know how can they allow the synergy between all these classes well it's up to your dm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're, you're not allowed to necessarily multi-class is a um and i i would argue it's um i like multi-classing with reason yeah, I, I think if you're a dungeon master who wants your game to be more balanced and I, I hate to use the word predictable, but I, I think truly predictable uh, truly, in terms of, yeah. of, of raw power, then simply not allowing multi-classing is fine. There, there are feats that allow you to get some of the juice of multi-classing, especially in the recent Unearthed Arcana with things like Fighting Adept and the, the one that gets you Warlock Invocations and stuff like that. But there, there are feats that will give you a little bit of the juice of multi-classing mm -hmm. without bringing in that whole heavy new rule set, especially when it comes to adjudicating spell slots and yeah. and how your casting stat interacts with another casting stat and and all of that nonsense. Um, <laughs> wizards going into fighter to get action surge so they can cast more spells. It's like, uh. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, yeah, there's some right. interesting cheese. I, I, Right. I yeah, always if, wanted if, to do it. If you're worried once. about the weird cheese, then as a dungeon master, just don't allow multi-classing. Your game will not be worse for it because it, D D works great as a single class game. It, it, it does. And what I but I do love multi-classing narratively in the game. So yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I am considering a change for and literally, um, so we've been playing Silver and Steel, and I play a mm -hmm. trickster character. Mm -hmm. And I and I and I we've talked at length about the Oath of Redemption. I'm like what happens when someone who is so full of like trickery decides to go paladin and try to do good? Mm. But I kind of feel like the Oath of Redemption is one of the sneakiest, sneakiest paladins mm -hmm. uh, mechanically. When mm. you attack somebody else and I reflect that damage back on you, that kind of stuff. The fact that you can burn Channel Divinity to get plus five on Persuasion. Yeah. Is this not the kind of thing a trickster would do or a character like Lucifer? Uh, uh from the series from neil gaiman um, <laughs> which you've just binged the entire thing i watched like. five yeah and i'm okay everyone i'm okay but, yeah well, well yeah. welcome to the new norm uh <laughs> I okay is a strong among word wolves. todd <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it is um but i i love i love multi-classing for character reasons and, and we see this mm. in critical role and a lot of live stream mm. games of you know uh uh we saw Ford, you know, drop Warlock because obviously this is a horrible thing for him. Mm -hmm. And to join with a little bit more of a wild mother inspiration for Paladin makes a lot of sense for that character. Same thing for Liam mm -hmm. um, in, in the very beginning of Critical Role, going from like assassin to a Paladin mm -hmm. to someone who uh, dealt death and now is perhaps 
uh, trying to atone for that and having this connection to the goddess of death mm-hmm. is interesting. These are interesting, interesting reasons to yeah. multi-class. They're character-driven moments. I, 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 yeah. I love multi-classing as a character-driven moment or to fulfill a sort of character concept. I'm, I'm always a little bit hesitant to allow multi-classing when it's just for pure build reasons. But yes. I, I also recognize that there are people who, who like love coming up with cool builds and, and and who am i to deny them if they're not you know if they're not harming the fun of anyone else i talked about this last time one of the players in my current game my stepbrother is playing a multi-class goblin uh, uh swashbuckler barbarian because he wants to be this crazy dodge tank and it's awesome it's such it's always a cool moment for him when he gets to quarter the damage of a gigantic melee strike taking like five damage off of a giant pummeling him into the dirt it's so cool um yeah and, i mean yeah. it's the same way um i, I you know i i love i love persuasion mm-hmm. i actually don't like deception as much but i like hmm. sneak i like sneaky stuff but persuasion mm-hmm. is always fun especially because uh it gives you a chance to role play and maybe it gives you a little backup on that but i've uh, certainly jasmine has like let me just given me a 20 basically because i gave a good speech as mm-hmm. a role player and so mm-hmm. that's been fantastic but i love reflection I love reflection and deflection in D&D. <laughs> I'm obsessed with it. I love reflecting damage back on you. I love uh, like drunken master being able to throw you know, an attack at somebody else. Mm-hmm. That stuff makes me laugh every time. And it's built into how you used to play in video games. I don't yeah. know why. Like I like it way more than doing damage to a target on purpose. Mm. I love a target to try to do damage and then get hurt for it. Mm-hmm. that makes me laugh and i think that's like the fundamental element of comedy itself for some reason <laughs> like you know like, like seeing bad people you know think funny things happen to bad people um there's a certain enjoyment in that and then that's why even though paladin oath of redemption seems so kind and well meaning i'm like there's an evil darkness behind that mm. i'm just waiting for you to screw up so i can punish you um, yeah right right yeah <laughs> so we'll definitely have to delve into that but uh, i think this was a great overview of oath of the vengeance this is all inspired uh, uh greatly by uh james hake's article that is up on dnd beyond right now it, it's uh basically the 101 for the oath of vengeance paladin and it will give you all the information you need to know as you like jump into this Again, like we said, if you like V for Vendetta, the crow, uh, Batman, if you like creepy bounty hunters that feel no emotion at all, you know, <laughs> this, there's a lot that can be done here. How, yeah. Real quick, Joey, uh, how would you make this comedic? How would you make this a lighthearted character? How, can <laughs> you do it? <laughs> I, would, I would make him... Uh... All, all, all of the comedic ideas kind of delve into like dark, creepy comedy, but I, I can see a guy like this being a very sort of Riddler-like character who mm-hmm. is all, all about exacting vengeance in very sort of karmic ways. Um, actually, this ugh, the more I think about it, this gets into dark, like sort of it does get dark territory, you know. It's like, uh, but it is so, someone who isn't lethal, right? They're they're kind of this yeah. prankster, this sort of agent of karma almost, who who seeks out people who have done wrong and tries to teach them a lesson in a very folkloric kind of way. Uh, and and they, they absolutely have to be non-lethal. They have to be someone who wants people to change their ways, to change their wicked ways, and become a good person who contributes to society rather than who just takes from it. I could see a character from Parks, or Parks and Rec I could see uh, someone who's very like <laughs> entrenched in in the politics of a city, and they're just really trying to make sure everyone follows the rules all the time. <laughs> like, you know, or or I don't know, a parking attendant. You know, like because you got those you got those hold spells all the time, right? You're like, no, or, you know, or a traffic cop, right? You know. <laughs> oh so, man. <laughs> so something like a more a little bit more middling, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a little bit more Dwight Schrute. Right. Tell me Dwight Schrute from The Office is not a vengeance paladin. Oh, my God. Yeah, They're well, talking. there it is. <laughs> so, all right, uh, everyone. That was Todd Talks. We've given you some great ideas and at least one really terrible one. Uh, <laughs> thank you, James Hake, our lead writer at d Beyond, for joining me and making this so much fun. Uh, we will see you next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.